Uh, Mike, uh, I think uh, your, uh, your point before as to, gee, what's the role of the, uh, the tax lawyer? Point is that, yeah, this is really not an area of law. This is an area of economics. So it means we need to orient our thinking appropriately. This and the following several slides are really focused at what do you need to be thinking about when you're uh, helping clients. So in a sense, uh, turning on your radar so it's always out there to uh, be alert for artificially high profits in a group company that owns few assets and conducts limited activities. You know, it does not take a rocket scientist to realize there's something wrong when you see this. But it does mean being alert to thinking about this so that you can identify these situations. Uh, maybe there's losses or marginal profitability in some uh, company in the group that's had significant operations for a long time. Uh, maybe there's transfers of property between group companies where the transfers are at book value instead of fair market value. And lastly, uh, uh, transfer of business activities as opposed to simply assets where there's no recognition of goodwill or other going concern values or other intangibles that might not be on the balance sheet. Remember, generally intangible property you don't see it on the balance sheet unless it was purchased from somebody else. Self-created intangibles, usually you're deducting the cost and you don't see, uh, you don't see an asset getting built up on a, on a balance sheet. Uh, why is transfer pricing a major area of risk? Well, again, as we've mentioned before, the amounts can be astronomical. Uh, we mentioned last week, I think, where uh, Glaxo from the UK settled with the IRS on a roughly three and a half billion dollar settlement. So imagine if they settled at that, what they what might have been at risk if they actually went to court. Uh, again, it's a very subjective area. High value intangibles, whenever they're involved it's extremely subjective as to what they're worth. The third point, more and more countries around the world are becoming aggressive at this because they recognize that there's a lot of potential revenue without a lot of effort in comparison with the level of adjustments they would make for, let's say, other things they might spend their audit time on. Uh, there's real uncertainty. Some countries like Japan are known for using secret comparables. What's a secret comparable? The uh, principle of comparability is that both the taxpayer and the government can look at unrelated party transaction information and all have the same information in eventually arriving at a conclusion or compromise or at least information for a court uh, uh, battle so that everybody's on the same page information-wise. Well, a secret comparable is that, well, maybe the Japanese tax authorities have gone in to visit, uh, let's say, uh, the Subitomo Trading uh, Company in Japan, which handles many, many, many unrelated party products, and they gather that information, which is available to them because they have the right as the authorities to wander in and walk around and see what's there. But you, working for you know some company that's getting audited on its transfer pricing, doesn't have the same ability to walk into Sumitomo's trading's offices and try to find out this information. Also, Gee, uh, the Sumitomo Trading Company is a huge, huge, very, very powerful distributor. Are they really a good comparable for real arm's length you know, dealing between related parties? I'm sorry, between unrelated parties? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. But there's economic power that they have which might 
not make things really comparable. The Japanese authorities will gather this information and say, we won't tell you where it came from, but we found unrelated transactions in your type of product, and this was the result, and we want you to use the same approach. We want you to use this as a basis. So how do you argue against something where you don't know the conditions under which it was, the information was gathered? So this secret comparable thing is, uh, is a major issue in Japan. Uh, in the absence of there being a tax treaty, there's really little ability to have your subsidiary that has under, you know, for, in, uh, for U.S. tax purposes now has less e &P. There's little ability to really uh, encourage the local country to uh, go along and give you a refund of taxes. It's just not going to happen very often. And uh, there's significant cost and uncertainty involved in litigating any 482 issue. So question, you know, why does it cost so much? These are usually very, very messy cases. The, it's very, very fact specific. You're not able to nicely research, you know, the court cases to see what the principles were and so on, because each case stands on its own. Just the gathering of the facts can be hundreds of thousands of dollars, especially unique intangibles. There's just simply no uh, no comparables. So. Significant time and effort by in-house counsel, in-house operating uh, and tax personnel, extensive outside legal counsel, and extensive outside uh, uh, economic uh, uh, consultant participation. So it just becomes a very messy and expensive situation. I think that the word painful to read really says it all. They just go on and on and on and on forever. and. They're so fact specific that uh, they're, they're seldom going to be a heck of a lot of use. Uh, this second bullet point is kind of an interesting one. Part of the messiness of facts is because often you've got the same operating people acting as directors and management of two or three or 10 different companies within the group. Well, which hat? was a person wearing when he made a certain decision, when he performed certain activities or functions. Uh, this can get very messy. You find conflicting information, conflicting information. Uh, in this, using this as an example, this Hospital Corporation of America case, they, of course, sold to Saudi Arabia their management contract on the base you know, of, a, of a hospital in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, they sold their management on the basis of how wonderful their systems are and how uh, they do all these things that are so valuable because they have all of this intangible, so to speak, skill and uh, knowledge and know-how and so on. Well, on the one hand, they're saying that to the customer to the IRS, they're saying, oh, you know, it was just the guy we sent out there. He did everything. So you see some very, very big differences between what you'll find in marketing literature or in uh, contract negotiation documentation and the face that is putting, being put forward to the IRS. You can see some very, very big differences. Now, how do we reduce risk, well, you want to be looking at your clients. Do they have some sort of conscious transfer pricing policy that is written and that, in fact, is adhered to and used on a consistent basis? There's nothing more than inconsistency to uh, make a tax authority, whether it's the US or any other country, doubt your credibility. Contemporaneously prepared documentation. You know, you shouldn't be justifying after the fact the crazy pricing that you've used. You should come up with logic ahead of time and have documentation that shows how you got to those results that you then used. 
that carries a lot more credibility and weight in discussions with any tax authority. Again, whether it's the US or any other country authority. A whole subject of itself is advanced pricing agreements. What's a, an APA as it's uh, lovingly called? Essentially, you sit down with one or more tax authorities and work out what pricing you'll use. You get agreement of the tax authorities. Language you hear is unilateral APA, which means, let's say, you're only discussing and negotiating with one country. There's bilateral APAs. So for example, say a Japanese company is exporting its product into, uh, it's manufactured in Japan, exporting it to the United States. Okay, two countries are involved. Uh, both the Japanese tax authorities and the US tax authorities and the taxpayer get together in a sense as a group and agree on a pricing approach that's bilateral. You don't see them as often, but you can have multilateral. The Japanese company has a subsidiary in uh, Thailand, which is uh, doing the manufacturing. And then it's sold to the parent company, and the parent company sells to the US. You could have a multilateral APA. So the point is, think about it ahead of time, recognize where your risk areas are, and rather than trying to unduly cheat one government or another, you let the governments figure it out so that everybody is happy. Maybe you're a little better off or you're a little worse off, but you're not going to be clobbered with a big 482 adjustment or transfer pricing adjustment by some other country later. Uh, yes? Is there a time limit to an APA? Well, they're, they're contracts. Uh, it's not so much that there's, uh, I, I, let's put it this way, I'm not aware of there being any time limits, but typically, uh, at least from what I've seen before, APAs will be two or three years uh, long. The tax authorities, in a sense, don't want them to be too long because, gee, maybe economic conditions change and maybe the method that is agreed today for the next three years won't be the appropriate best method four years from now. So I sort of doubt that there's any uh, legal issue on the length of it. It's a contractual issue that uh, I suspect only that uh, is subject to both parties not wanting to be tied in too long. The effort to make an APA is not a simple week and a half effort. Typically, it's going to take one, two, or three years to negotiate and conclude the APA. Uh, part of APA negotiation can also resolve open issues from prior years. That sometimes happens as well.